Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Salim Um I'm uh, currently the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Dhaka, the Independent University Foundation. I'm also a senior fellow of uh, IIED, the International Institute for uh, Environment and Development, who are one of the co-organizers of this event. And I started this event many, many years ago. I think the 16th TNC Day is here right now. Um, and we started it as a one-day adaptation day event many years ago at the top, and it's grown uh, since then, so it's a pleasure and privilege to be here. So what we're going to do in the next, uh, how long do we have dinner? About an hour. Uh, is to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's happening at the conference of parties and the negotiations. Uh, none of us are negotiators, but we're observers of the process, and I'll invite Donna and uh, Sheila to share their views of uh, what's happening. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just give you an update on where we are. And this has come to me by my colleague Achala, who many of you will know, uh, who provides support to the East Developed Countries group of negotiators as of last night. So as of last night, we have some progress. We now have the COP presidency taking over. Uh, you know that so far we've been having the subsidiary bodies meeting, the SUBSTA and the SBI. Those are now over and the COP presidency starts and so we are now in the official COP as of now. Uh, one of the uh, accomplishments, if one might call it that, is that the APA has been completed. How many people know what APA stands for? Can I see a hand? That's not bad. Uh, it's the Ad Hoc Committee on the Paris Agreement, which is now over. It's completed and started. We now have the Paris Agreement and we will move into uh, the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, ministers have started arriving and will start taking over the negotiation process. Uh, from tomorrow onwards, there are four high-level sessions uh, being organized over the course of the week. There are a few issues that were not resolved that are never resolved in the first week. They always go to the political uh, leaders. Finance is always one of them. Uh, this year, loss and damage is one of these issues, which we, the vulnerable countries, have been raising. And then differentiation between uh, Annex 1 and non Annex 1 is always an issue. A um, couple of additional items that are uh, peculiar to COP24 uh, that were um, on the agenda for discussion here. One was how to take on board the messages that came out of the Talanoa dialogue uh, that Fiji, the president of COP23, initiated last year in Bonn and have continued since then. Uh, I've been a participant in a number of Talanoa dialogues that have been a brilliant uh, means of engaging uh, the public into giving uh, inputs into the COP. Uh, but we're not sure how those inputs are going to be taken on board in the COP. There's a difference of opinion on whether they should be uh, noted or simply ignored. Uh, and uh, we shall see what happens with the ministers. And the final point I want to share for those of you who have been following this is the uh, adoption or the recognition of the uh, IPCC Special Report on 1.5. Uh, um, as you all know, we heard yesterday from Deborah here a presentation on that. So the, the issue, and this is a very good illustration of how the language, text language of uh, the negotiations is so peculiar. So the, does anybody know what, what the issue is? The issue is one word. One group of countries want to note the IPCC report. Another group of countries want to welcome the IPCC report. <laughs> For most of us, it doesn't make any difference. But I can tell you it makes a huge difference. This is an extremely politically sensitive issue. The group of countries that don't want to welcome are Saudi Arabia, the United States, Russia. The group of countries that want to welcome, because we are the ones, the COP are the ones who ask the IPCC to produce the report and to welcome its result, are all the other developing countries, particularly the most vulnerable countries, who are sticking to the word welcome. And they're not going to accept changing the word welcome to just simply noting it. We shall see what happens. This is actually one of the ministers that had an argument about it. We weren't able to resolve it, and uh, the chair of the subset has taken it, passed it on to the ministers. So it's, a, it's an illustration of how, for outsiders who are not uh, 
inside the negotiations, the arguments can seem very arcane. And, and you don't understand why are people arguing about what seems like a very simple issue. But it is every word, sometimes even a comma, uh, can make a big difference. Uh, I know a couple of uh, um, uh, people in the audience are negotiators, and I'll come to you uh, in a few minutes and ask for your uh, opinions and, and views to share with the rest of the audience. But basically, what we are trying to do here in this session is to uh, enable people who are not negotiators to find the best way to follow negotiations most effectively. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my advice and then I'll pass it on to Donna, who's been doing this for some time, to share her experience. And then we hear from Sheila, who's actually doing things on the ground in terms of practice. And the idea of the government climate days is to link practice with global discussions, each of us doing it in a different way. So for those of us who are not negotiators, and we're coming to a COP uh, for the first time, our way of following it is to pick the part of the COP uh, or the Paris Agreement in this case that you are interested in. If you're interested in adaptation, if you're interested in if you're interested in mitigation, you choose the article, you have to pick which one is of relevance to your work. And then attend those sessions, find out who the negotiators are for that, find out who the non-negotiating observer groups are. There are a number of observer groups. There's the Ringo group, there's the CAN uh, group, there's the Yango group. There are many groups, women's group. Uh, join one of those groups and, and associate yourself with the people who follow those issues, learn from them, and they can interpret and help you understand. And then if you're really interested in continuing the relationship, country negotiators who are uh, negotiators in the bar. And it will take some time for you to get some level of knowledge and expertise in following the uh, negotiation process. It's not easy to do immediately, but if you're interested enough to do it, then you can continue. The very fact that you're here in that week say, at COP24, it is uh, an opportunity for you to do that. So I hope all of you will do it over the course of the next week. So I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to uh, Donna, ask her to share her view uh, and a bit of her experience of how she got into the process and how to follow it as well. And then we'll ask Sheila to share her thoughts with her. Donna. Hello. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Donna from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And um, I'm here to share with you what we've been doing and how we've been doing things and how we actually see the strategic opportunities within the negotiation and how we get on the ground. So as a part of the Red Cross Red Crescent family, the Climate Center represents and works in close coordination with the Federation in, um, in engaging in the, in the process. But for us, we don't engage only in the cops. We, it's, it's a continuing engagement. Uh, and so it's, it's a process that builds on as time goes on. Um, I would like to focus on four things um, in telling my story. One is the ambition. For, for the Red Cross family, it's very clear. The reason why we're here is because we are already seeing the humanitarian impacts of, the, of climate change and how it makes vulnerable communities more, more vulnerable. And it didn't be consistent with this narrative. There was a point earlier in the game about negotiation and being consistent with the narratives. And I think this is really helpful, not only because it, it, it gives um, you connect with the negotiators and with other parties, and they know exactly what your message is. Um, so for, for the Red Cross to be able to really add value and contribute to the, to the discussion, we are really following closely two items, adaptation and loss of damage. Um, why? Because adaptation is really the closest um, intersection with the risk reduction world and the humanitarian um, um, worlds. And also, it has the best entry points for early warning system, vulnerable communities, comprehensive mismanagement, and blah, blah. Um, So, when we say engage, we've been engaging at the subsidiary bodies. So, um, just, like, just like what you said, choose the topic and the people. So, we've been um, um, closely linking up with them for at least four or five years consistently. And the, the trust has been established and the, the lines has been uh, strengthened. Um, so so in, in terms 
terms of narrative, really be consistent, keep the ambition alive, but keep it grounded, and keep your messaging really concise and um, consistent. Second is always find various options. Comp is not just about the end of the year kind of thing. Um, there are a lot of options in terms of engaging, but also a lot of options in what we contribute. We contribute innovative approaches. We contribute things that actually work on the ground. And we contribute things that make a difference to the lives of the community. Again, live with your ambition and um, give it options. And um, I think the entry point here is the talent of a dialogue you are able to contribute there. Um, as well as the newly uh, uh, um, created uh, platform for the local communities and indigenous people, LCI. And I think this is, a, this is really an important opportunity for us who are working on the ground to, to be heard and really be part of the process. Third is strategy. I think I identify the edge points not only at the global level but also how it connects to the national level. As auxiliary to the government, the Red Cross, Red Cross, and family is in a very unique position wherein we work closely with government. So what we hear at the global level, we connect it in the national level and vice versa. Um, whatever is happening, whatever we're doing at the community level, we connect it upwards. So I think finding these options and themes or entry points is, are crucial. And also one more thing that is not really being maximized, I think, in the process are other platforms, like the Nairobi Work Program, the, the Focal Point Forum, why I attended it for the first time actually this year. And I found it very interesting talking about economic diversification. And things are actually doing on the ground, and the process is just allowing to get examples and allowing to, to, to know what is happening. Um, but in terms of strategy, communication is key, as we know all know. We speak different languages, and um, they speak kind of really different set of uh, narratives, and we say, oh, okay, that's not the problem. We're seeing simply on the ground. So, so I think having that um, strategy. And um, there's a word we use in the Philippines in disaster risk reduction. You, create, you make sure it's part of your muscle memory. So be consistent in your strategy. Just repeat that again and don't get tired. Last but not least, I think it's that We are in this together. We are in a positive way and um, be propositional. And I think um, when there's a when you feel there is a blockage here, find other ways. And I think the positivity will keep us going. Great, thank you very much, Anna. Engage effectively in this process. So I'm now going to invite Sheila Patel, who spends most of her time with the slum dwellers in cities around the world. She represents the Slum and Shack Dwellers Association International. But she also uh, is a member of the uh, recently created uh, Global Commission on Adaptation, which we heard about yesterday, and does a lot of representation at the high level at global events like this uh, on their behalf. So I'd like to hear her experience on how to do this most effectively. Yes. First of all, I want to just thank so supportive for my learning curve. Uh, I was dragged uh, screaming and yelling into the last talk. I was traumatized because I was invited to speak at an event where many very high powered financial people just came in, said their speech and left. And everybody had to leave before me and another community and it incensed me so much that somebody like me who never cries, I cried in furious anger. To think of what would have happened to me, what would have happened to one of my community leaders if they were there. It was the most humiliating and disgusting uh, experience. But it made me realize that the entire community of people that I represent face that every single day because exclusionary behavior has become a way of life in cities in general. And many of us do it unconsciously with 
without understanding that the choices we make do that. So I've taken down every single thing you've said, and we do it in our day-to-day -day life. Because one of the most important aspects of our movement, and subsequently somebody who is an anthropologist and studies social movements is they only come up with the law doesn't work for you. Because if the law works for you, you will be doing a project. But when the law doesn't work for you, when what you think is essential and necessary for survival is not acknowledged, then you need an aggregation of really large numbers of people to shout and scream to say that your system doesn't work for us. So I our involvement as a social movement is recent, we are just 20 years old. But it's very special because it's a movement where 80% are women. Uh, we tease the men in our network because we say you don't have patience, so you can't be central to this process. And they agree. And we, we grapple with our commitment to stay deeply local and to explore ways by which we engage the city, the, the state level, the provincial levels, the national levels and the global levels. And for us, uh, coming into the climate change process, we feel very comfortable with what we will need to do to address these different levels. But we see that the very complexity of, uh, of being excluded in the habitat and the urban space are going to be deep barriers in the climate change discourse. So when I got invited to be on this uh, commission, uh, I thought it was so symbolic, you know, a <coughs> Activist. It was so politically correct to put on, on these committees. They didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> I hope so. And, so. and so my presence in, in this event is to seek alliances. You are a very important and old friend whose hands I'm going to reach out to. But I want to do that with everybody because what I realize is that the nuisance value of Lots of noise is very important before you get invited to the dialogue, like the telephone. And it's really sad that I am leaving the day after and I got invited to be on that dialogue and I'm not here and I can't change my ticket. But it, it, for me, that's a very important thing. Aggregation of large numbers, you know, like you said, stay persistent, be dogged. Once you choose something, you don't let it go, stay with it, and make friends with your worst enemies. I want to add that. When I started my work as an activist, and all our work starts with fighting elections, and our biggest enemy were the mayors and the municipal commissioners. And as a middle class educated person, I had lots of really smart, you know, Hurtful things to say that you say to people of your own class. But the community women told me, not only really don't do that, they humbled me with a very interesting saying. When you live in a lake, you don't attack the crocodile. <laughs> and so what we have started doing is these women have actually developed amazing ways to make friends with the people who conduct the evictions, with people who are in the police, uh, with municipal administrators, and today engage municipalities and provincial governments and national governments to the extent that those people have the capacity and the political acumen to see how much this engagement works for them. We still have, I still have many housing ministers and urban development ministers who sort of quickly turn around and walk away when they see me because they know I go after them and ask them. So those are the techniques. And when I look at climate change, I see 
several real big challenges. And the first challenge is that the urban poor are not seen by national governments as worthy of attention. Rural poor are the good poor. The urban poor, yeah, they, you know, they deserve the country support. They deserve the international attention. Uh, universities, I don't know how many of you have done your PhDs on rural processes. The urban poor is not a urban poor. So it starts with that. And one of the biggest crises that does is you don't have identity. And so when you work in urban areas, you will realize that when there is a disaster, even international aid cannot reach them because they do not have the documentation to get real restitution. So when you're doing this kind of work, my plea to you, when, whether you are negotiators or your institutional arrangements are there, that you think of what you do. The way we deal with it is that when we have national crisis, we have a program called Know Your City, in which we produce our own identification for communities that have no identity, that have no formal documentation. And so our group goes there, in the Philippines, for instance, where there are mud slides, I think was how this goes. These guys go there and they do a doc, they, they draw the map, they draw where the houses were, and they document the people, and they take it to the city authorities and say, these are the people, we can bring every one of them in here, testimonials. So we, wa we want to look at ways by rituals like this become part of the systems that you have. The other very important thing is, that urban poor people, in their way of coping with resilience, street heat and cold and rain and drought as part of their ongoing existence. And they are, like, these are celebrated as resilience. I get very annoyed. You know, oh, these are strong survival instincts. I remember David Satterthwaite came seven, eight years ago. And a bunch of people in Orissa just told him, oh, it's 46 degrees and we lost four people out of no, it happens everywhere. <laughs> so these kind of things, we have to educate ourselves to understand that those are not natural in a mm. sense, and there has to be something. And we are looking at ways by which habitat transformation can reduce the heat and things like that. The other thing which we don't understand is all these differences between meticulous and mitigation. <laughs> Choose which one. We think all of them affect us. Sure. So, for instance, right now we are fighting. We didn't know we were fighting mitigation. But you know, there's a lot of investment going in infrastructure in all our countries. Ports are being redesigned, railways are being redesigned, public transport, solar farms, you just name them. These are going to create eviction challenges for un undocumented people, both in urban and rural areas. And I'm just discovering a very interesting thing, that I was invited to be on various committees of uh, northern organizations, and I realized that many northern development assistance, bilateral assistance, actually give technical assistance in the form of engineering firms doing these jobs for southern countries. And we are working in three places where the ports are being designed. And 50 to 100,000 people will be evicted if this happens. And when we talk to the engineering companies, they say, but you know, you should go and talk to that government. We can't do this. We are just professional designers. So they take no ethical responsibility. We go and talk to the government, they say, but you know, in the terms of reference provided for technical assistance, we were told that these issues will not be dealt by us, it will be dealt with them. So we are no man on no man's land, on no person's land. And so I feel that somewhere this artificial difference in, you know, disaster, adaptation, all these words which create wars have to be removed. On the ground it means, and, and, and even worse is that now that private funds have over, overtaken 
development funds in terms of what cities are looking for. Uh, when we go and tell the city, okay, we want secure water points, we want to make sure that there is sewage treatment to reduce toilets. They say, but when we go to the climate funds, they say this has nothing to do with us. It is to do with uh, SDGs. So, how many which sub people are you going to produce to say, I, this part of mine is resilience? <laughs> and I think that, and the, the good thing that I heard in conversations I had with many of you is that there is an attempt, a strong attempt to articulate the convergence of SDGs and climate change. And that's something that has to be worked on. The second last thing is about the architecture of funding that we generate. Uh, my colleagues, uh, many of you are here, uh, when we ask you to uh, write a proposal that would help people like us address this, they say it takes us so long to even get registered in those directions. And so my sense is, are we going to wait for 10 years for that architecture to change, or are we going to fight and shout and we don't care? That's and the last thing is, you know, there, there has to be a very robust understanding of how urbanization is going to transform cities. Most of the people that I have met here are working in rural areas. In the few instances where I was invited to be part of those organizations moving to cities, there is an amazing old-fashioned 19th century understanding of what that transition is going to be. And I think we have to work together to produce a more robust understanding of how quickly the, the metamorphosis of a rural identity turns into urban discontent. And so I would, I would urge as, as, as an event of addressing urbanization and climate change, that this, this artificial divide, this unability to understand transitions is also a change. And so finally, we as STI work in 23 countries. We have an interesting informal alliance, again informal, with other networks of urban poor who are social movements. We're all struggling to be recognized, to be noticed in the climate space. And we would love to have some form of engagement in, your, in these programs where we come in as partners. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.
that it matters. Every bit of warming matters. And this was, of course, not nice in the ears of those who still make a lot of money with selling fossil fuels. And uh, therefore, it was, you know, already before the meeting here, there was a big debate on the agenda, whether there should be a specific agenda item on the substance to consider the special report or not, for instance. And the final decision was there is no specific agenda point. It was only under research and systematic observation. And uh, those who study the conclusions when special reports or assessment reports have been considered under the COP, uh, you might know the language that was usual. And it was already known in advance so to say for the insiders, that some parties cannot uh, agree to a language that is stronger than to know. And what is now the lesson learned is that contrary to earlier cops, failure is an option for some parties. And I think that's very important and it has been mentioned even in interventions yesterday that this is also relevant for more material decisions because that's not a very material decision to choose note or recognize or whatever. Uh, but there are material decisions to be made later this week and also there you have to expect that if red lines from those countries will not be crossed. They would not agree to something that is beyond their red lines. And the decisions are not made by those here in Katowice, but those in the capitals. They don't mind the, what the situation is here. They don't really listen and study the reports. They have their view. And there are, you know, the issue is that those who make those decisions, they agree that we have to face out fossil fuels. Even Maxcom could say that. But the issue is the speed. And uh, speed matters. And this becomes visible when you compare the emission pathways of 2 degrees pathway to 1.5. And the implications when how much carbon dioxide removal do I need and what does it cost? And finally, it's all about financial issues. And uh, here the times are very tough. When it comes to finance, this is usually the toughest part of the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Klaus, for that. Donna, did you want to comment on this? Yes, I just wanted to add, um, I think um, what, when, when we heard about the noted and welcome messages yesterday, first I, had, I, made a, I had, a, had a personal reflection, and this is exactly also what we're seeing in countries, um, how governments are, and the scientists and the medical officers are not so linked with each other. But I think I want to emphasize on the message yesterday. I, I would be really encouraged in the next coming week we can use this as an opportunity to engage with parties and talk about, okay, um, even if we the not or welcome, that's a text there. I know it's important, but I think what, how we should say that on the ground is more important to us, you know, those who are working you know, in countries. And how we can immediately, right now, keep the dialogue warm and engage with the, the negotiators. Okay, give them this, let's do this, let's prioritize this, 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 and that. I think that will keep us also moving um, and um, not be too stuck with the words on the there. Great, I actually love that. So I'm going to now wrap up uh, in the interest of handing over to the next session and share with, uh, I'm afraid not, Klaus, I'm sorry. So uh, what, what I'm going to do is to um, share some reflections and then maybe respond to some of the questions within that. So for those of you who don't
all know this. I think many of you do know. This is my 24th apartment. Right? I'm going to every single, single apartment. <laughs> exactly. One of my friends asked me, you know, why do you keep coming? They say, does it make me depressed? I say, it doesn't make me depressed. But for a global problem of the scale of climate change, it's the only global governance treaty we have. It's not good, it's not perfect, it's far from perfect, but it's the only one we have. So unless we engage in it, we're not going to get any kind of global uh, uh, impacts. And over the years, the one thing that to me has made a big difference, and I said this yesterday, I'm going to repeat it now, is we do have the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement, in my view, is an extremely forward-looking, liberating agreement, because we have now agreed how we are going to tackle the problem. And implementing that agreement does not require more negotiations. It requires people doing things, multiple stakeholders at local level, uh, urban level, rural level, everybody. All of us, every single person in this room is an implementer of the Paris Agreement in and of ourselves. And we don't need another negotiating text to tell us what to do. We know what to do, we can do it. And I'll give you a very good example of that. Even though Mr. Trump has officially withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, that doesn't mean the Americans have withdrawn. If there's a pavilion in, in the talk with the American people there, with, we are still in. They, they're still in. All my friends are still in. They haven't left the Paris Agreement. They're in the Paris Agreement. And in fact, if you look at the U.S.'s track record of emission reduction, they actually want to meet their Obama uh, <laughs> commitment. Trump can't stop that. You know, he can be paid by the coal lobby to come and do coal, uh, uh, you know, uh, promotion of coal, but nobody's buying coal anymore. Nobody's investing in coal. It's done. It's very dead. It's not that uh, uh, the future is not in coal, despite what Mr. Trump does on behalf of the coal lobby. You know, we're looking for uh, vested interests and corruption. I can't think of anybody who's more corrupt than the President of the United States who's in the pocket of the coal lobby. Right? He can't. You know, look at developing countries where nowhere near that level of uh, uh, corrupting uh, an entire government uh, with a particular lobby. And now it's a fight. So it's a fight to the death with this lobby. These people cannot stop us. So to answer the question of whether the word matters, the word doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The words on the piece of paper don't matter. The clash that underlines those divisions between whether we know and whether we welcome is what matters. And that is a very, very fundamental clash between those that wish to solve the problem, attack the problem, and those that don't want to solve the problem. And those who don't want to solve it are no longer doing it out of ignorance. They're not denying because they aren't convinced. They are doing it as a criminal act. Okay? They are protecting their own interests at the expense of the rest of us. And we have to take it on as a war. It is not something that is anymore uh, amenable to discussion only, although discussion is important and we need to bring them on board. We, wherever we can find consensus, we should definitely try and find consensus. But we can't wait for consensus. The, the, the issue that has happened over the last 24 years of the UNFCC is it was created to prevent the problem. It has failed to prevent that problem. The problem is now on us. The reality of climate change is now on us. So that takes over. Tackling climate change is more important than talking about it now. And we all are the ones that are going to tackle it. And we need to think about how we do that more effectively in the future. And only part of what we need to do is to make sure that the, the officials doing the negotiations actually do something substantive, raise the level of ambition, agree on a rule book, whatever it is that they are negotiating uh, endlessly and into the night uh, about comes out with something that's useful, but we don't look to them to lead. We look to them to follow us. We have to become the leaders now. And I think the Dr. Climate Days, in a sense, when we started this 16 years ago as an event, it was like the anti pop we, we had an event on the side on the weekend where people can relax. You wear your jeans, you come in, you meet uh, friends, you network with them, uh, you find ways of moving things forward. I think we need to go beyond this function of simply networking and sharing and being collective action and challenging those who are in the other side of town doing the negotiations and as Sheila said, making our voices felt there. And we can do that. It, it is possible to do if we do it strategically. So
So I look forward to further conversations today and uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share. Uh, now I'd like to uh, ask you to thank our panelists and hand over to